Um, you know, we're about three weeks, 23 days into the new administration. How has the atmosphere from your vantage point changed on Capitol Hill um, and just in Washington in general with a new uh, with a new president and a new party in the Oval Office? Well, Republicans are energized because they know that if we can get 60 votes for a lot of things in the Senate, uh, that's seven votes less than what we needed before because basically very few things passed. Uh, you know, if, if the president disagreed, it would take a override. Right, and that'd be votes. So now, with only having to get 60 votes in the Senate and 51 in the House, and if the president agrees, uh, we've got a chance to move forward in a number of areas that I think a lot of people back in our part of the country agree on. It. So a lot of it, and what we're focusing right now, is regulatory reform, regulatory relief. Uh, Obamacare, naturally, is an item of real interest, but I think one of the things that people kind of forget about is, is that we're in the personnel business in, in the United States Senate. And so we spend a lot of our time working our way through the cabinet nominations. And then after that, a lot of the other individual offices that also have to have Senate confirmation. So uh, right now we're intervening, we're we're interspersing both attempts to get cabinet members on board, along with uh, attempts to repeal some of the regulations that the last administration did in the previous about six months of the administration. And they do that with what they call a Congressional Review Act. Uh, what, the reason why we're using it is that we've only got 60 working days in which to take advantage of this on what the previous administration did. And each one of them requires 51 votes rather than 60 votes. So it's a chance to repeal some of the regulations that were put in place that we disagree with. And that's a, a lot of where the focus is at right now getting cabinet members in and then also getting uh, congressional review actions of disapproval across for as many of those regulations as we can. That way we don't have to pass laws to repeal the regulations. Okay. Um, Now, the Trump administration's executive order with regard to a pause on immigration and refugee resettlement, that's obviously tied up in the courts right now. What would you like to see happen um, with regard to all that going forward in the immediate future? Well, I think the president has a couple of issues that he's got to contend with. First of all, the uh, whether or not the original executive order was properly written and whether or not it allowed for the appropriate court challenges for individuals that had green cards or who, you know, could legally be in the United States and who were traveling. I think they tried to, to make it clear that that was their intent, that individuals who had a passport, you know, that had green cards already and could legally be here, um, that they were not subject to this travel ban. Uh, that didn't come across very well. And, and in Washington, the, uh, the appeals court hit them pretty hard on that. And so I think that's one thing where, that they could clarify. The second part is, I think most of us in the United States, the vast majority of us understand how important it is not to discriminate based upon religious points of view. And I think in the executive order, they have to be, make it abundantly clear that this is not because of religious views but rather strictly because of where the countries are at and the fact that they have a very difficult time in those countries detecting and restraining uh, individuals who would cause harm in the United States if they could get here. The other, and so I, I think the other part I want to see, I want to see this truly as an expedited process. The sooner they get in and review it and get back to a normal process for immigration, the better off everybody will be. And then I think they have to take a look at what we call the the immigration waiver program or visa waiver program, because individuals from other countries can come into one of our friendly countries and pick up a a visa basically from that country in. And then it's waived. A, A lot of the security issues are waived. And we think that's the way that a lot of terrorists would try to get in. And in fact, we had we had a number of hearings on it. Uh, in in Congress in the previous session about ways that we could improve the visa waiver program. And I know that the Obama administration had begun a process of reviewing that. I just hope they've got it completed and that they've patched a lot of the holes that were identified in that as well. Okay. And when you were talking about the seven right there, you're referring to the seven countries that uh, President Trump had highlighted, right? Correct. Okay. Um, There's been a lot of negative reaction to uh, Betsy DeVos' confirmation as Education Secretary. Some people, some, um, have expressed concern. What are you hearing from constituents 
and are they largely in favor or against? Uh, what, what are you hearing from constituents on, on the, our new Secretary of Education? We did have people on both sides of the issue make contact, but clearly there were more who were opposed to her. But what we found in going back through a lot of the comments, and, and a lot of it was organized of uh, uh, type contacts that we received, but they were pretty substantively the same with a lot of the folks who wrote in personally. And uh, most of the information and most of the concern that they expressed to us was twofold. Number one, they said that, that they were concerned with uh, her support of charter schools and voucher programs for money. But I think we've tried to get back and send a message back out to most of the people in South Dakota to reassure them because in South Dakota, the legislature has made it very clear that we do not have a voucher program. Uh, and, and second of all, that not only do we not have a voucher program, but we don't have charter schools. And so her support in some of the urban areas for charter schools was because those kids didn't have a chance in the public schools that, that they had there. And so, you know, and, and I think in some areas of the country, the union, the teacher unions have been very concerned about the fact that she really has not shown a lot of support for the teacher unions. And so they see her as a threat. Um, personally, I like I like her as a nominee because she likes local control. And uh, I think our Department of Education in South Dakota and our local school boards, teachers and parents can do a great job and they need they need less coming from the federal government, not more. And I think she's the right person at this point to be able to respond and to make sure that the ESSA, which was the replacement for the No Child Left Behind that we passed last year, gets appropriately uh, put together. And that gave a lot more power back to the states and local units department. And I think she believes in that, whereas the last Secretary of Education really tried to undo a lot of what the Congress had passed. Okay, one more question for you. I mean, there have been some constituents who have said they're concerned uh, about her contribution to your campaign, how for that $46,800, how that may have influenced your vote for her nomination as Secretary of Education. How would you well, respond to that? Well, first of all, I wasn't even aware that she had contributed any money to my campaign, and I'm not even sure who it was that would have contributed, whether it was a family member or a business or someone who was connected with her, because I normally don't look at that kind of stuff when I look at policy issues in Washington. But I can also tell you that a lot of that has been put out in an organized effort by Democrat parties and their affiliated organizations. And in fact, I'll tell you how far it's gone. One of our compatriots, one of our senators who's a Republican in another state, was actually attacked because he didn't get any money from her. And when he voted for her, they said the reason why he voted for her was because he wanted a campaign contribution for her from her in his next campaign. So you can't win either way on that. As long as people are attacking us and, and, and attacking, suggesting improper motives, and that's the way some people operate, uh, to me, it, uh, all we can do is recognize that that, unfortunately, is a part of the political process today. And I think most folks in South Dakota understand that, uh, that that's all it is, is, is if they can't win on the argument itself, they go after you personally. And that's part of what we have to deal with. Gotcha. Senator, I know you're a busy man. Anything else you'd like me to know before, uh, before we hang up the call? Well, just that, you know, right now we've got a lot more to go through. Uh, we want this president to succeed uh, in those areas where we agree with him. We're going to say publicly that we do agree with him. In those areas where we disagree with him, we'll make sure that we let folks know that we do disagree with them, but we're going to do it in a respectful way. And hopefully as we move forward and they get through the growing pains of a new administration, things start to, to work a little bit more smoothly. Great. Well, have a good uh, rest of your day in D.C.